What's up, well that's good fam. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Y'all, I know you're gonna be so excited for today. We have one of everyone's favorites, including my own, back on the podcast today with a new book, which she has one of the first copies of. You gotta show it. We have Christine Kane on the podcast with her new book, Don't Look Back. Hey, Sadie, I am so pumped to be on here with you. I'm so pumped. You got it. Can you give everybody the peek oh, of the book? Okay. Here, okay. You're getting like the oh, first, yes. first look. I know. It is it looking is. good. It looks <laughs> so good. Which this podcast will come out, I think, right as the book comes out. So yeah. maybe people will have seen it by this point. But so excited for the book and just so excited to be talking to you here. We were just talking before we pressed record. And I'm like, what's new in your life? And as always, every time you ask Kristen Kane what's new in her life, it's like, oh, I just got back from five countries. <laughs> and oh, it's like so cool. So you guys have been on the go-go. Yeah, we have. And also my eldest, Catherine, she turned 21 and she's studying in London at the moment. So part of this trip is we got to stop in London. Uh, Sophia Sweet. came our youngest and we had a great 21st for her as well. And then, so of fun. course, did all the other stuff that we do in Greece and Bulgaria and Israel and France and <laughs> Ukraine and Poland. So it was awesome. <laughs> It's awesome. I know. I told her before, I said, okay, so our next plan in life is to stop what we're doing and follow y'all for a little while and just learn from y'all how you do all the things you do with two girls. And uh, oh, now, you know, they're older and they've yeah. graduated once in college, but how you did it so well, like, I just learned so much from you and it's so fun. And so I I'll have to get all that advice later. Um, we have a lot to talk about, but also I have to just say, I am so excited that I have finally found a way to get the Kane family to come to Louisiana this summer. <laughs> we are so excited that you're coming for conference. I am fired up. What you're doing with the young women, Sadie, it gives me so much joy. And um, to get to pour into them, are you kidding me? I mean, this is what I live for at the end of oh, the day. So stoked. it's awesome. I remember a conversation we had a couple of years ago where I said, you need to come to Louisiana. And you were like, well, aren't there like bugs there that are like attack yes. you? And I was just and like, alligators <laughs> and, and all alligators. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, if you can go to the Ukraine and Greece and all the places you go, you can come to Louisiana and uh, brave some bugs. <laughs> well, you know, Louisiana is my husband's favorite state in all of North America. So oh, that's um, awesome. he's looking forward to coming. And him and Christian, I think, are not going to be hanging out at the women's conference as much as oh, they're no. going to be doing boy things. <laughs> Trust me, Christian already has an itinerary for them because they <laughs> formed a little bromance when we so we randomly ran into Nick and Chris in Copenhagen which we were both at a, the same event in Norway we all flew to Copenhagen uh, like not together and we found out we're all there and she's there with their kids we have honey with us and so we decided to meet up for dinner and then I don't even know whose idea it was I think it was Nick's and Nick was like talking to Christian and my brother-in-law Jacob he's like we should totally go jump in the ocean tonight at midnight. And the ocean there is freezing. Yes. And Nick comes and picks them up. And midnight, they go jump in the ocean in their underwear. I'm like, what is y'all's life? No, what is y'all's friendship? I do want to say, since we're on the public record, <laughs> I was asleep in my hotel room. And Me asleep. too. Like, y'all do what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, we were like, yeah, y'all can do that. I'm not <laughs> yeah. participating. So I, I can't wait for y'all to be here. Um, also, before we get into the book, I just thought this was really cool because I saw you at Passion, I saw you at If, but we haven't talked about um, the Asbury revival and just some of the stuff that's been happening around the country. And I, when I saw that happen, I could not stop thinking about your message at Passion where you talked about learning to linger. And um, I wanted to ask you about that in reference to just the revivals that had taken place based off of what you said, how much of that do you feel like really was um, from the posture of lingering in the presence yeah. of God? Because I thought that was a really cool display of what you said. Totally. And, you know, Sadie, the year before, so 2022, I started to see snippets of this all around the world. And, wow. um, you know, there, there's so many things happening, I understand, but I would like, you know, put on social media, I, I'd be in all these random countries and go, there's something happening. People are lingering in the presence of God. It seems like 
something is stirring and people are like, Chris, you're just an optimist, you know, <laughs> like um, things are just like all going downhill. I'm like, no, I think God is really starting to meet with people in a very palpable and tangible way. That's what made me, I think, preach that sermon at Passion. It was like, you're, wow. um, I've been around 35 years ministering, especially to college students and students. That's been a big part of my ministry for the whole 35 yeah. years. And I know in my own life, I've been blessed to see uh, revivals in my lifetime, truly from mm. Australia and different pockets around the world. And the key has always been not a system, not a schedule, but people that are hungry to just mm. linger in the presence of God with no agenda other than yeah. I just want God for himself. So at Passion, it seemed like everyone so resonated. And in a way, all of us preached a version of a message like that. Basically, we were saying nothing else matters only yeah. God and his presence. Yeah. And I think that came across the whole conference. Then to see two months later on university campuses and, of course, Asprey, and then you hear it in different campuses around yeah. America and also in Europe. I have friends that have been uh, texting me and just now I've come back from Europe. There are pockets everywhere where people are going, we've had 24-hour prayer meetings. We've been in prayer eight hours a night, every night straight. Wow. Like it's just I'm, just, I'm, I have never been more excited in my whole Christian Come life on. to see God doing something so awesome in our generation. Yeah, come on. That's so cool to hear you say, especially because you mentioned being around in ministry for 35 years. And so to hear you say that is no small thing. And, um, one thing I actually wrote down to talk to you about, and it was something you talked about in your book. I want to go find it. Yeah, you said, uh, as we age, we do not need to buy into the narrative that our best days are behind us. And when I when I read that, I was like, you know what? You live that out so beautifully because I've heard you say on multiple occasions your age. And there's a lot of people who um, are your age or older who don't want to say their age. It's a weird thing. It's like once you get past 40, no one asks me how old I am. And I don't really know why that is. I don't really know what to think. But I love how you own your age. But I also love how you're not like sitting here being like, oh, back then, back then, back then. But you're like, actually, like what's ahead of us is really cool. So I want to ask you about how do you own your age and any advice to people out there who fear the next birthday coming up for whatever reason? Yeah, you know, that's a real question because I know your audience is predominantly young. So I have a 21-year-old daughter and I have a 17-year-old. And I remember when Catherine hit 19, she had this existential crisis. And I was watching her <laughs> have this meltdown. She's like, Mom, this is my last year as a teenager. And she's like, I can't believe I'm going to be 20. Like she was, it was for her, her last year as a teenager. And I was trying not to laugh and I was trying to be very sympathetic and just go, yeah, I can't know. This must be a big deal. And uh, but here is the deal. I'm going, Catherine, it just gets better. Number one, I'm going to be 57 in September. People go, why do you say your age? I'm like, honey, at my age, I'm glad for every day. There are people that never, even, you know, my dad never made it to 57. My dad died wow. at 52. So I'm like, wow. are you kidding me? I've already lived five years longer than my dad did. So wow. I, I remember when I lost my dad, I was 19 mm. when my dad died. And wow. my dad died when he was 52. And I remember thinking even then, every day that I live beyond 52, I'm going to be so thankful to God for that. So why, number one, would wow. I complain? I'm not buying into the narrative of this culture that just says mm. everything has got to be youthfulness and youthfulness. The Bible has got a lot to say about getting older. Hopefully, Good. as you get yeah. older, you get full of wisdom and knowledge. And, you know, I always say Caleb was 85 and he said to Joshua, I'm as strong now as I was then. Now give me this mountain. He said, I'm not retiring. I'm not cashing in my 401k. Moses promised me Hebron, so I want Hebron. So I keep saying, I have been working 35 years for your generation to help create pipelines and pathways for young people to flourish and get into the fullness of God. But God still has a plan for me. I mean, if he yeah. didn't have a plan for me, I would never have woken up this morning. I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be in heaven partying with Jesus. But since I'm here on earth, it means God's got a plan and a purpose. And with God, it does. You go from faith to faith, from grace to grace, from glory to glory. Come and on. I want a younger generation to see that it just gets better and better. It just gets awesome following Jesus. 
Some of you guys know that we're building a new house right now and we're so excited about it. One thing that we just picked out was our new bed, but with the bed, we had to have a mattress and who doesn't love having something customized? My friends at Helix Sleep know exactly how that feels and they want you to feel like you have a customized best sleep of your life every single night. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that tailors mattresses to different types of sleepers and their preferences. They've got 14 unique models to fit whatever your needs are. They've got luxury, they've got kids models, and even big and tall models. There are some tall people out there in my family for sure who definitely appreciate that little extra leg room. Helix will help you find the perfect mattress for you with their two minute sleep quiz. Just answer a few questions about your sleep habits and they'll tell you exactly which model works best for you. We were matched with a Helix Midnight mattress, which is not too soft and not too firm and has a cooling effect that Christian and I both love. And I'm a side sleeper and let me tell you, it is amazing to wake up without aches and pains from tossing and turning during in the night because they made a mattress perfect for us. Why would you sleep on a mattress made for anyone else? Helix will pick out one just for you and your personalized mattress is shipped to your door, which might be the best part, totally free. The setup is quick and easy. All you have to do is literally take it out of the box. It is literally that simple. Helix knows there's no better way to try out a new mattress than by sleeping on it. So they're also gonna give you 100 nights to make sure that you love it. Plus, all Helix mattresses are American made and come with a a 10 to 15 year warranty based on the model that you choose. Some of them have extra responsive foam layers to cradle your body. Some have enhanced cooling features to keep you uh, from waking up overheated. There's so many extras that make them just so amazing. But all Helix Sleep models have a hybrid design for the perfect combo of comfort and support. So friends, you don't just have to take my word for it though. Helix has been named number one mattress by Wired Magazine and others. It is also recommended by leading chiropractors and doctors and it got over 12,000 five star reviews. So they have some pretty legit credit to their name. So go get the best sleep of your life. Try out Helix right now. You'll thank me later. Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. It's a pretty big deal. So go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie. Go check it out today. This is their best offer yet and it's not going to last long. With Helix, better sleep can start now. Go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie. Come on, so good. I like, I'm telling you, I think if people just had like a little uh, Kristen Kane that could come with them on their shoulder and uh, <laughs> speak into their ear all day, we'd live a lot better life. But hey, that thank God for a podcast because we basically do have that. That's it. Um, but it's so encouraging. Uh, I, I love how you just have such a great perspective on life and you're so energetic and fun. And one thing that cracks me up is, you know, when the pandemic started, everybody kind of took on new hobbies, right? Like we all did something that we probably hadn't done before. Like I signed yeah. up for college, okay? I made it one semester, but hey, <laughs> we did it. I might return later, but uh, yes, the pandemic, you know, it led us to yeah. do things we hadn't tried before. And for you, you talk about in the book that you started doing these motorcycle safety courses because you are a motorcyclist in Cali, which is just epic and awesome but it also you know took a bit of a spiritual turn and really taught you a lot in those classes so talk to me about one signing up for that and where that even came from and then also just the base of this whole book and the direction that you're going with this message okay yo, before you think I'm a hero I, I'm not really a motorcyclist I'm a Vespa rider because I love <laughs> okay. you know I'm Greek I love European roads I love Vespa riding so in Australia and Sadie, you're going to laugh because you know me, so the thought of this is crazy. I used to ride a hot pink Vespa. So no it was way. Just, Yeah, literally. One day I need to post that. I'm going to post a picture of Please that. Please so post it that. Was, it was like hot pink and nobody could work it out. So I'd be decked out in full black Harley Davidson, like jacket, pants, yes. uh, helmet on this hot pink Vespa. And so I, rode, I rode it everywhere in Australia. Then I got to America and just kind of didn't get around to it. And, I mean, you got freeways. I mean, the biggest freeway in Australia sort of got four lanes. I live in L.A. So there's like, you know, 20-lane freeways, I think. And yeah. it's like, Chris, you've got to be careful. But then the pandemic hits. And he, he bought me for my birthday a Vespa. This time it's cream. It's really Italian. It looks really cool because we were, um, I was ministering. I was preaching in Italy and I started to go, I want a Vespa. I want a Vespa. And so we thought, you know what? Why not? I'm in my fifties. Why not get a Vespa? And so <laughs> he bought me this Vespa and, it, and then I found out I had to get him. I thought I could just transfer my Australian motorbike license to America, but I couldn't. So 
it, because of the pandemic, I'm home. Um, he signed me up for a motorbike licensed school. So I turn up and there's all these young guys like your age on their <laughs> cool Ducatis, you know, they've got their Harleys and I come in on my Vespa. So imagine they're looking like at this chick at the time I was like 55. Nobody, <laughs> nobody was like over 30. And there's me in my little Vespa. They've got all their Ducatis and all of them, all their eyes rolled. They thought this poor old lady, here she is coming. <laughs> and um, then I, I got so into it. And so then I became like everybody's mother at the whole thing. And it's then so there was this moment that, you know, you've got to do all your, uh, your mm-hmm. traffic rules. So they, they put you on there. I, it's really good. I recommend to anyone, please, anybody listening to this, I'm going to be your mum for a minute. Go to driving school. Okay. Before you drive the bike. Because, um, a friend of mine once gave me this great advice, which is true. There's only two types of motorbike riders, good ones and dead ones. It's not a joke. So you've got to be really, really, really yeah. good and careful about what you're doing. So, um, as we were coming around to turn, because you learn to take turns uh, to turn a corner. Now, every one of us, your natural thing is kind of like to look down, to look at your bike, you know, because you're scared you're going to fall off. And the uh, instructor is like, Christine, look straight through that turn to where you want to go. You've got to keep your head up. Mm. You've got to not look down, not look round at all. Just look straight ahead beyond the turn to where you want to go. And then he said these words, which, of course, I repeat throughout the book, where you look, you will go. And that is the bottom line in life because Scripture tells us the same thing, which is why Scripture says fix your eyes on Jesus because where you look in life, you will go. And we are living in a day where there are a million distractions. I mean, you know, I know from switching on your phone in the morning to everything throughout the day trying to grab your attention and the truth is, wherever you end up looking, your body will follow. And, yeah. you know, most of us don't just run down the wrong path. We normally start by looking down the wrong path. And you look, wow. sometimes you glance, sometimes you linger. And I was mm. talking about that at Passion. I go, oh, you, wherever you linger, you will yeah. go. And we are created to do that. So you've got to train your eyes mm. to be fixed on Jesus and your purpose on the other side, we're all going to, you know, go through obstacles, hurdles, challenges, but you've got to train your eyes not to look at that, to look beyond that to where you want to go. And that's where you're going to end up in life. So good. Gosh, I love this message. And it is so needed. Like so many of these quotes that even I pulled out. I mean, if you get these quotes, if you really start to live your life like this, it changes your life. I mean, it changes the whole game. I, I can think about times in my life where I've had these shifts in my perspective. I remember somebody once told me, he said, Sadie, you know, your rear view mirror um, needs to get a lot smaller and your your windshield a lot more clear because I was just constantly looking back, looking back, looking back. And I remember taking that word and being like, man, like you're right. I was always looking back to past mistakes, past failures, which made me feel like a hypocrite to step into what God was calling me to do because I was so stuck in what I did, what I had done and who I was and not who I was becoming. And so I, I think about that in my life and I'm like, man, this, this message that you're saying really did change my life. And I'm so grateful that I got this message because I would not be doing what I'm doing now because I'd be so stuck in what I used to do back then. Well, totally. And And I want to just say for your generation as well, it's so important because you are growing up in a generation where the screen and phones are there and it keeps permanent records of not just our successes, but our mistakes. And so a lot of times people think, well, the don't look back message is just for when you get older in life and, you know, don't because a lot of people, and I think this is when you say, Chris, you're full of energy and you're always looking forward because all of us have sat around those tables at holidays, family holidays, where you've got maybe the grumpy old person that's going, well, back in my day, things were so much better and (laughs) everything's, you know, and um, you go, man, I don't want to end up like that grumpy old person. (laughs) Um, But when I'm young, it's awesome. But what I'm finding, especially with younger generations, is there is such heightened anxiety and depression and despair. And I think some of that is because the enemy has made us, we, we just stare and scroll oftentimes through our mistakes or even because you might have a degree of success, you know, a post may go viral or something might happen and you're thinking, oh man, I'm never going to get that again. And that's never going to happen again. And you know, you can end up getting into a depression and you're just looking back, trying to go, what was the magic formula or what can I do? Or only if I didn't do that. And I think Jesus 
uh, wants us all, whether you are 20 or whether you are 50, to say the message of the gospel is that we are looking forward. We're looking forward to the promise yeah. and the purpose of God. And of course, during the pandemic, and I think a lot of your generation as well as my generation um, really got stuck. We got stuck because we thought the world has ended as we know it. Uh, yeah. How do I move forward? And people got stuck in despair, maybe chaos, anger, disappointment, disillusionment, unforgiveness, bitterness. I mean, pick your thing. Yeah. And here we are in 2023 and a lot of people still haven't moved on. And that's really where this message came out of because I would travel the world and I would hear people constantly, no matter what, well, either they'd say, you know, well, before the pandemic or my life before or before yeah. I made that mistake or before I failed in that thing or before yeah. that relationship busted. Or And I'm like, whoa, do, do you think God stopped with you? I mean, God, there's no mm. before or after my mistake mm. or before or after a pandemic. There's a before or after Jesus rose from the dead. That's it. So it's before Jesus came or after he rose from the dead. So I'm like, y'all, that's it. There's a brand new start right. for all of us. So don't be thinking, man, if I just didn't make that mistake, if I just didn't fail, if I just didn't, yeah. you know, blow at that time, then you go, your whole life stops at that point. Or if, man, if that post went viral and I've never done anything that good again, I'm like, do you think for your time on this earth that it's all stopped? And, of yeah. course, you know, it's all wrapped around Lot's wife who who turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back. You know, the mm -hmm. angel of the Lord said to her, don't look back. The world as you knew it, and, of course, that was Sodom and Gomorrah, is burning up. It's burning down. Where there's mm -hmm. no going back to that. And to be truthful, the world as we knew it has changed. That's the bottom mm -hmm. line. It, it's changed in every way out there in the real world, morally, politically, socially, economically, environmentally. And your generation is living through the fastest rapid growth of change ever. No wonder anxiety levels are up. No wonder yeah. despair levels are up. No wonder depression levels are up. So if you do not learn at your age to fix your eyes on Jesus, you can end up getting stuck and your body might be moving forward and time might be ticking forward, but everything about you just stays stuck in the past. Wow. Gosh, that's so good. That's so real. I um, I encourage everyone who's listening to go back and, and just dwell on a lot of the things that she just said, because that's real stuff that a lot of you are probably listening to, and it's waking you up to where you've been, a cycle that you've been on in your mind. And um, gosh, I wrote this quote down that you said in the book. And you said, instead of glancing back to learn, grow, develop, and repent, we've grown accustomed to constantly looking back. And I wanted to ask you about that, like the proper um, view of looking back versus like kind of a toxic cycle of looking back. Because so there's this quote at my church, and I honestly never liked this quote. I love my church, but I've never liked this quote. And I'll tell you why, but I want to ask you about it. So when you come into our church, it's like on the wall, and it's like um, a place where you don't have a past, only a future. And the reason why I haven't loved the quote is because I feel like part of the beauty of the future, like, like for instance, part of the reason that it's good to look at the past sometimes is to say, man, I once was dead, now I'm alive. So the power of me being alive is that I once was dead. Like this is the story of my past is like, yeah, I was dead, now I'm alive. Or I once was blind, now I can see. Like there's some beauty to acknowledging that there was a past so that you can see the miraculous power of God in your present and in your future. But then there's a danger of getting like stuck in the past of, you know, just constantly living there, viewing your sake. So I love how you say like, instead of glancing, we grow accustomed to looking. And so is there an appropriate view to have of your past to hold on to for um, almost like a humility way? Or do you feel like it is one of those things where you really just got to get past it. We're, we're going to the future. We're in the present because that's just something that I always see that quote. And I'm like, I don't know if I like that. But when yeah. you talk, I'm like, I love this. Y'all, we have so many dreams as a child that we want to pursue when we're older. I had all kinds of dreams ranging very ver as a variety of different ways. I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast. I wanted to work at Sonic so that I could rollerblade. And I also wanted to be a weather girl. None of those happen, but whatever your dreams are or your future looks like, Liberty University can help you achieve those dreams and those goals. With over 700 residential and online degrees, Liberty has something for everyone. And even better, they offer tons of scholarships and discounts so that you can reach your goals at a price that you can afford. 
Liberty University's mission is to train champions for Christ with a well-rounded and Bible-based education. And on the campus, and the campus is awesome. If y'all have ever seen it, it is absolutely amazing. Over 7,000 acres, state-of-the-art facilities, and tons of clubs, teams, and intramural sports. Plus, they've got a lot of options for visiting the campus. They offer a one-day tour, like Tour LU and Experience LU. They also have college for a weekend, where seniors can spend a weekend living their life as a Liberty College student. My family has been to Liberty University several times because my siblings... Actually, like most all of my siblings have gone to Liberty University, so we spent a lot of time there. I've gotten to speak at convocation there, and we just love being on their campus. Um, also, I got to take some classes for Liberty, and I loved it. I learned so much. It was uh, very doable with a busy schedule to do online Liberty because they make it super um, lifestyle friendly. Liberty also has a private accredited online Christian academy for K through 12th grade students. It's called Liberty University Online Academy, where my sister Bella actually went and did the program and went through high school there and so she loved it it was great for her and then she ended up going to Liberty Online for college as well and it's just wrapping up this year so this is an awesome and affordable homeschool option it's flexible and it's easy to start anytime and even though students are remote they're so intentional about creating a community and offering extracurricular activities like clubs and field trips because it's all online Liberty University Online Academy students get 24-7 access to a detailed self-paced curriculum taught by certified teachers. Sometimes you just got to do things at your own pace, right? If you're about to start college looking for a new career path or you're looking to check out a homeschooling option, Liberty University has got you covered. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie to plan your trip to Liberty or to learn more about Liberty University Online Academy. And because you're a Whoa That's Good podcast listener, if you decide to apply to Liberty, you're actually going to get your application fee waived. So hey yo. So friends, don't wait. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie now and get started on your future today. Okay, yes. And let me, I think, obviously say what um, the power of the quote in your church, because I, I would imagine this is why it's up there, is that you're not defined by your past, that Jesus okay. has forgiven your past. And I'm sure that's exactly what it means. And because so many of us allow our history to define our destiny. And so wow. we think, okay, um, a mistake that I made there, uh, the sin that was back there, the way I lived back there, I can never move past my past. And so I think what that quote is saying that yeah. in Christ and the redemption of God and the, the fact that Jesus died for our sins on the cross means you do not have to be limited or contained about your past. Now, What you're bringing up is really important, though, because the danger, there's a a scripture in Philippians chapter 3. I I write about this in my book because it is important. What you're bringing up is very, very important. Paul says this one thing I do, forgetting those things that lie behind, I press on. Now, a lot of people have taken that scripture to mean, well, okay, I'm going to forget it. It's, you know, the past doesn't exist. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm just moving on. And then 10 or 20 years in the future, the undealt with elements of their past, it does come back. Um, and if you don't deal with your past, your past will deal with you. And yeah. so the issue is that the blood of Jesus does not give us amnesia. So as you know, with my story, I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born. Um, I was the victim of sexual abuse for 12 years in my life. Uh, I was you know, a daughter of Greek immigrants, very marginalized because of my ethnicity, my gender. Those things are real. I'm born again. I'm filled with the spirit of God. I uh, love leading people to Jesus by God's grace. I, I've i been married for 27 years. I've got two daughters. My life's moved forward. But I've never forgotten the fact that I've been, I was abandoned in a hospital, that I was sexually abused, that I was very uh, marginalized because of my past, but what the blood of Jesus does, it's not, I don't have amnesia. I'm not like, that never happened. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. called lying. Faith <laughs> is not calling those things that are as though they're not. That's not faith. By me saying that never happened, wow. that never happened. That's called lying. That's not called faith. Wow. Faith is calling those things that are not as though they are. So hmm. when I was beginning to heal and deal with my past before my past dealt with me, I had to start calling forth my healing, even though I wasn't living in the fullness of it yet. Now, today, 
I'm living in the fullness of it a lot more than I was at 22 when I started, but I had to start somewhere. So I had to start, Scared. okay, this is the reality of my past. I can't change it. It's not going away. I can't dismiss it or deny it, but I am now going to start the process of making what Jesus did for me bigger than anything that happened to me. And when I learned to make what Jesus did for me, it didn't mean I denied what happened, but then the healing process could happen in my life. And with, with therapy, the help of the Holy Spirit, a great Christian community, over many years of a process, I can say, I think with integrity now, I have moved past my past. My past doesn't define me. My past doesn't determine my future. Uh, There is residue every now and again that comes up. The Holy Spirit will show me, Chris, now I want you to deal with this. And he doesn't do it all at once. Mm -hmm. When I got married with Nick, when we started dating, well, certain things that, especially from the abuse of my past and the abandonment, well, there was a time then, a very intense six-month period, where for me to be ready to be married, a lot of things, sorry, everyone, this is like I'm trying, Sadie made me be cool and put all these <laughs> things in my ears and they fall out. Um, but the thing is that I, I had to deal with a lot of my brokenness. Now, I didn't need to deal with some of that in other ways, but I was about to get married. I was about to enter a very intimate relationship. So, of course, those areas of intimacy that had been broken in my yeah, life yeah. as a child and then in my teenage years, well, then now because I was going to get married, either – I was going to deal with my past or my past was going to deal with me. And what I mean by that is if I did not allow the Holy Spirit to come in, get some therapy and begin to really deal with it, I would have made Nick pay for something he never did to me because it would have come out in my brokenness. And so in that time, there was a deep, intense, now you couldn't live like this all the time, but the Holy Spirit had to do a very deep, it was painful, it was so hard. Thank Mm -hmm. God for a man that was willing to walk through that with me. But because of that, 27 years later, we've got, by God's grace, a flourishing marriage. Well, then when I got pregnant with Catherine, man, a whole lot of new stuff came up from my past. I was in ministry, I was doing everything. Now, I didn't need to deal with some of that, but then the Holy Spirit was like, okay, Christine, now you're going to be a mother. So you're going to have to deal with some of the issues of where you were abandoned as wow. by your own mother in a hospital, how you had a complicated relationship with your adopted mum. Christine, if you're going to not bring that brokenness into your own mothering, you're going to have to be willing to do some wow. healing. And so then we went through a really intense healing period so that Catherine wouldn't be paying for something that she never did to me. Yeah. Then the same thing happened with Sophia. And it goes through that when we started A21 and I was going to be working up close and personal with the rescued victims of and survivors of human trafficking. Well, that brought up some of my own brokenness with Mm. what happened to me as a victim of childhood sexual abuse. So then the Holy Spirit, so throughout my life, it's it's not a once and done. Yeah, There have been different seasons of God working through things when my mother died when I was 50. Man, that brought up a whole lot of other, and again, Mm -hmm. and I tend to go through these six month intense cycles. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to need some counseling help. I'm going to need um, some other tools to be able to move forward. I think because I've chosen to do that, that, which has meant in those turn times, I had to glance back to go, okay, I'm glancing back. What do I need to learn from that? What needs to be healed from that so that I can keep looking forward? And that is the difference between being stuck there and constantly looking back the alternative could have been I could have spent my whole life so let's say Sadie I was abused for 12 years but in September I'm going to be 57 which means I haven't been being abused for 45 years why would I give the enemy any more time than he took from me he took those 12 years I can't get them back but God has redeemed that Uh, with a lot of work of the Holy Spirit, of counselling, therapy, Christian community, being in the Word of God. God has redeemed it. But if I just kept looking back, and that was the entire identity I had for the whole of my life, I would have given him 57 years, not just 12 years. But Jesus, as I made what Jesus did for me on the cross, bigger than what they did to me all of those years, Mm -hmm. then I have found freedom and wholeness and the ability to keep Mm. moving forward. And that's the difference between looking back and glancing back. That's the difference between denying and sweeping under the carpet and going, oh, it didn't happen. It did happen. There were consequences. There was residue. Yeah. But I am 
part of the body of believers that believes that Jesus can restore. Jesus does redeem. Great. There is a life beyond your past. And I could live in the full. This was God's plan for my life that mm-hmm. uh, by his grace, I'd marry Nick. I'd raise two great daughters that we would have a 21 equip and empower that I would do what I do around the world. Now, if I just kept looking back when I, uh, you know, about, and my whole identity was in what happened to me, yeah. then I would never have fulfilled that purpose. Not because I couldn't, but because I wouldn't, because I kept yeah. looking back. That's true. Not because you couldn't, because you wouldn't. That is so yeah. true. Gosh, everything you just said is so good. And exactly why I wanted to ask that question and bring that up is because, and you know, I'm not really one to nitpick things or, you know, I'll look at a quote and even if I don't love it, I'm just like, oh, that's good. And, you know, I get it. But I wanted to bring that up because I do think that some people hear things like that or read things like that. And they're like, okay, like, don't think about it. Don't, don't look back, don't look back. But it's like, they've never dealt with it. And there are real life things that you need to deal with. And I love how you said, like, you have to take the the time to go through six months at times to go through the counseling, have the conversations, let the Holy Spirit move. And I can think the same thing in my life. I mean, it'll be months where it's like, okay, we need to take some time on this, like time out, hold on, let's work on this. Now move forward and and be healed from it. And yes, be redeemed from it and all those things. So I love you. You explained that in the best way. And I love how you talked about also like you can get your identity wrapped up in your past and your brokenness. But I think in the same sense, you know, we kind of talked about this with the old grandpa being like, oh, (laughs) back in my day, everything was great. (laughs) But I think like also sometimes we do that even as 25 year olds where we go, you know, back in high school, I was crushing it, you know, back in college, I was in the sorority or I was popular. I was the star athlete. I was this, I was that. And we get our identities wrapped up in the past. And I just wonder like, how do you not get stuck in who you used to be whenever who used to be might seem, um, better in a sense than maybe who you are now, because I think it's really inspiring watching you for me because you're, so much further ahead of me doing so much of things that I, I want to do in ministry, reaching people, touching people, all these things. And I'm like, it's cool to see you go the distance and continue to see God as a God who's going to do more. And I think that sometimes like the enemy will lie to you like, oh, you've already done it or the that you've already had yeah. like the highest peak, like what's next or whatever. And uh, I feel like a lot of people feel that way, even at a young age in their 20s, looking back oh, yeah. at college and high school and the glory days, if you will. Hey everyone, this is Sadie's mom, Corey. You know I love the grandma life. I love having all my grandkids over to my house and I really want to have fun, creative things to do when they come. I do not want grandkids that just sit in front of a screen. So y'all know I love KiwiCo. So every kid is different, but KiwiCo keeps kids learning and growing with super cool subscription crates. They're full of projects and experiences that will spark their creativity. So they do the low work for you and you get to spend more quality time with the kids in your life. One thing I really love about KiwiCo is that every single product is safety tested, but they're also kid tested. So we know kids love them. And that's a lot of testing because they've created more than 2,000 projects for kids who love science, technology, engineering, art, and math. My grandkids are all different ages and stages of learning, and KiwiCo has them all covered with projects for every stage of development from newborns all the way to teens. I see so many kids with their faces glued to screens, and we know it's not good for them. So it's awesome that every KiwiCo crate comes with enough projects to keep them entertained for hours. KiwiCo will even help you find the perfect crate for your kiddos with a quick quiz, or you can pick any crate that and delivery plan that works best for you. So recently, I got to do one of the KiwiCo projects with my granddaughter, Honey, and she is this girl loves her play kitchen so this is a whole play kitchen set and it came in and it's like baking but the fun thing is that each of the crates there's learning that goes along with it so there's like early math skills you can count and learn little little fractions and all these things all while just having fun with your grands after seeing how much honey loves these projects it's easy to see why kiwico has delivered more than 40 million crates so redefine play with KiwiCo right now. Get 50% off your first month. Crates start at just $14 per month plus free shipping on any crate line at KiwiCo.com. Promo code Sadie Rob. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping at KiwiCo.com. Promo code S-A-D-I-E-R-O-B. 
That's KiwiCo.com promo code Sadie Bob. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because the truth is I've been to so many parties where people, say even my age, are talking about what they did in college. You know, when I played football or, you know, I was on the volleyball team and I'm like, you'll probably need to work out a bit right now. But anyway, you know, you're just kind of, um, but you could be doing that at 25 or 26 because sometimes uh, my kids will have friends over and if they've got older siblings, truly they're like sitting around at the parties like you know having a beer or whatever and they're talking about their high school game I'm like honey that was like seven years ago you know what has nothing else happened in the last seven years (laughs) I think in my own life I've just made a decision no matter what accomplishments I have I celebrate them but then I don't build a monument to it so this was going to make you laugh okay so here's some of my Forrest Gump confessions when I was um, in Australia I was in the under 18s Australian table tennis team. I know I am Forrest Gump. Okay, that, that is my. Is so cool. yeah, that is like I was number four in Australia in the under 18s. So you know that was like. Wow. Now think about this. This is 40 years ago, and I could still be talking about. I got my medals. I got my trophies. I've got my ribbons, and I mean, I was a mean table tennis player, <laughs> and so I cool. still got to say I pull it out. It is my. My a trump card, I should never have pulled, I said this on this podcast because at every youth camp, if I still go to youth conferences, um, you know, all the, this is how I get legit instant credibility because I go <laughs> down and they're all playing ping pong and they think, oh, this poor old lady. And, I, and you know, normally I'll start, I'll just play with my left hand. I'm right-handed. I play with my no left way. hand just so that I look really hopeless. And I go, oh, do you want a game? And then I've got all these guys, all these jocks, and I'm just like, okay, then I'll just beat them 21 love, 21 love, 21 love. And they've just got like no idea. Yeah, it's just, so you know, awesome. we've got to play another game. We've got best of three, best of five, best of seven. And I'm like <laughs> cracking up. Now That's imagine so if I spent my whole life because I was good, I used to play, you know, six days a week and uh, and travelled so much for it. Imagine if I thought, imagine if that was the pinnacle of my life, like, wow, a little white ball across the table and at 57, that's what I'm still talking about. Imagine uh, how limited that would be. So I want to yeah. encourage anyone, if you get your identity from your last accomplishment, it is the beginning of the end. Your identity must be in Christ. Dang. Your identity must be in what God has for you. So even now, by God's grace, you know, with A21, uh, we've had amazing accomplishments. We've had awards from, you know, the mm. UN, the President's Department, from all over the world. We've Our Can You See Me campaign has gotten, uh, you know, London Film Festival, Prague Film Festival, Cannes Film Festival awards all over the world. Now, to be honest with you, I don't even see those awards. I've, I got the Mother Teresa Humanitarian Award. I went to Mumbai, India. I received that award. I thank God for it. It was awesome. I don't even know where it is. Like there's nothing in my house that has got anything. I'm sure they've got it in one of the offices somewhere. I don't see it. And I, in my own way, um, I, I, that's a thing that I've just decided to do. I don't put any awards up. I don't put any ribbons up um, I, because I want to be looking to what the Lord's got next, because I, I don't want to get caught up in that. I remember during the pandemic, we cleaned our garage up like everybody, you know, and so my girls were in all these boxes and I'd forgotten because there were boxes when we moved from Australia 15 years ago, I hadn't opened and the kids are opening them. And that's where they pulled out all of my awards. Like, mom, did you play table tennis? Mom, did, and they're like pulling out all of these awards from, and I started laughing uh, because some of them they pulled out. Now you've got to imagine these trophies were like 40 years old. They'd come across the world, so they like broke in their hands. And I thought that's awesome. that's what the Lord thinks about it, man. It just like broke. And, and then, awesome. I, but I'll never forget Catherine said to me, Mom, I'm so happy and so glad and grateful that you never said anything about this because neither of my girls are athletic. They're really good with, um, I like Catherine's like, you know, the head of her sorority. She loves all that life. She's like the, the, that. And <laughs> Sophia loves to That's read, awesome. you know, my soap. She's like so quirky. She loves to read and um, she's into music and, but they're not athletic. And I just, you know, I never even realized how important it was as a mum. And I know you've got mums that watch this as well, not to put any of my expectations because I love sport you know I climb mountains I do my deal but I'm so grateful that in a sense um, I didn't put any of that on them and Catherine said I'm so glad I like never knew she goes I think I would have felt pressure 
that I would have mm. to live up to, you know, either doing that wow. or in the same way that I've never put pressure on them to uh, want to do anything like I do in ministry or on a platform because I want the Bible says, and you're going to have to do this with honey and your new baby, that it's train up, you know, your children in the way they should go, not in the way yeah, I went, but the way great. they should go. So I want to see what God's got for them um, yeah. and help to f- help them to flourish in the gifts that God's given them. So in a sense, uh, you got to be really careful because in your mid-20s is where it can get really dangerous, to be honest, of where you get stuck and you just turn up and your Saturday night parties become talking about what happened at college and talking yeah. about who's ended up and then you suddenly get to 30 and 40 and you've done nothing new and you're still talking about what happened at college. Wow. Gosh, that is so convicting in the best way because I'm like, you know, I've been in so many of these circles, including myself, where I'm talking about something of uh, the past and just dwelling on it a little bit too much and even found myself wrapped up in that identity. I I found myself in that for a while with sports and it took me a while to kind of let that go. Like that was awesome and that was fun, but that is not where I'm at now. And that is not what defines my life. And um, it's just so easy to get your identity wrapped up in these things when you work so hard towards something or when sure. that's what people um, know you for for so long or whatever it is. And I love that you said that, though, about just the perspective of a mom, you know, and not putting that on your kids. And even in some of those um, things that you talk about, things that you share, where your trophies are, because it shows where you put your value, you know. And um, my mom has done such a good job at that. Like, truly, we did the same thing recently where we found all of her artwork and um, it was like stunning, like so good. I mean, she majored in art in college or minor in it or something. She she went to college for art and now my sister's doing art. But my sister even h- hadn't seen all of her stuff. And my sister saw it and was like, mom, like this is incredible. But it was the same thing. Like she didn't feel the pressure to be my mom. She's been able to go and like find her own look and her own design and all this stuff. And me and my sister both now are about to put paintings that my mom had in our houses because we like loved it, but we didn't even know, you know? And I just think that's so cool because it's a part of her life, but it's not all of her life. It's a part of what God did in her past, but it's not like the thing that she is defined by now, even though that's a part of her gifting. And so I love that you said that. And it's such a good word for me just as a mom raising two girls who are going to be different, who are going to have different personalities and different giftings and different things that the Lord put in them that are different from each other and different from me and different from Christian. And so that is such a good word. And I know we have a lot of young moms listening to that. That's going to be huge for Uh, Last thing I want to talk to you about is you talk about your best friend in the book. Dawn, I believe, is her name. (laughs) And I just love it because we talk a lot about sisterhood and friendship um, within the LO world. I mean, our conference is LO Sister. Uh, Our other podcast is called Sisters and Friends. So we love sisterhood. We love friendship. But I love how you talk about, you, and you said this earlier, how you had to work through some stuff in your life so that you didn't put on Nick something that Nick never did, or you didn't put something on your daughters that they never, that they never did or went through. And I think sometimes in friendships, it can be really hard to not bring past hurts of friendships and past distrust and all that into new friendships. And so with you and Don's relationship and like y'all sweet friendship, how have you not brought in hurt from other friendships into this one that has had such longevity or what's the difference that you've seen in that one? For sure. Yeah. Because this one's now decades old. Well, a lot of that is into any relationship, whether it's friendship, marriage, parenting, whatever it might be, the greatest gift you can give anyone is a healthy you. So the more that you are whole in Christ, then you are not going to demand from other people what only God can give you. And so I think a lot of times we do bring the past into the present, especially if we're not healing in certain areas. And you know, a lot of times someone will do something or we'll have some uh, something happen in a relationship and then we'll define all relationships by that. That's not like every person. That was that one person. Yeah. And so that's why ongoing healing is so important. I'm a big proponent of that. You know, anyone that knows me, I'm full of faith and I'm full of like overcoming our past and stepping into our future. But I'm not into denying our past. I'm like you can only, you've got to name it so that it can be healed. Mm -hmm. And if you won't reveal it and name it, I often say God can't heal what you won't reveal. And so if you just bury it, 
you are going to carry that. And man, there is nothing worse than a stinky corpse. You're going to bring that toxicity yeah. into every relationship. And someone's going to do something that's going to trigger some unresolved thing from your past. So the more you can allow the Holy Spirit to bring healing and use what and there are in now these days, and this is the great thing of growing up in your era, there are so many tools. There is so much access to therapy or great books even or great communities that you can be given the tools to go, I don't need to carry the toxicity of that relationship into this relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think obviously being open and not looking to people to be what only God can be in your life. So I truly believe the stronger you are with the Lord, the more whole you are, then the more joy you can have out of your friendships. I think a lot of what you have to be careful in it, particularly in your generation. And I love the emphasis on sisterhood. I love the emphasis on community and finding your people, but never forget that God is your person. (laughs) It's Jesus that is your person. And so, because otherwise uh, people are flawed, people are human, including us. We hurt other people unintentionally, uh, you know, many times. And so people will let you down and people will hurt you. If you elevate them to a place in your life that only God should be, then you're going to live in constant disappointment. You're going to want to put walls up. You're going to say, I don't want. And, you know, be the kind of friend that's not always taking but is giving. And the more whole you are, the Bible says it's better to give than to receive. So the more whole I am, I'm not just coming into a relationship for what you can get, you know, give me. But it's like, man, what am I going to bring into this? I want to bring life and hope. And ultimately, I want to help you move more towards Jesus. It's great. Gosh, so good. Chris, your <laughs> advice is so good. And I love, like I mentioned, I love talking to you because every time I talk to you, I feel personally so inspired. It's these kind of podcasts that I forget I'm supposed to be hosting and I just start <laughs> listening and then I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm like, I'm supposed to ask a follow-up question because I'm, I'm personally just being impacted so much. And that's because I look up to you so much. And so thank you for being the real deal. Thank you for continuing to write awesome books that inspire so many people, showing up to podcasts, showing up all over the world to just, uh, man, preach the gospel and bring people closer to Jesus. You're awesome. I love your family. And thanks again for being on the Well That's Good podcast. Well, thank you. And you know how much I love you. I thank God for you. And you give me great hope for this generation and for my daughters. Like, thank God for you. Oh, it's so sweet. Well, I love them. And I'm excited to see y'all soon. We'll be there. I love awesome. you, girls.